Welcome to the Handyman Pros Radio Show, home improvement and maintenance tips from the pros. This episode, How's It Going? Going Gone! A tips and tricks discussion about selling your home featuring Pam Evans of Hello Pam Evans Real Estate. Thanks for listening to another edition of Handyman Pro's radio show, where our goal is to help you save time, money, and aggravation. This edition's titled, How's It Going? Going Gone! To help me explain, I'm here with my ever-cheerful co-host and old buddy, John. John, haven't you been doing a bunch of updates on a house that's going on the market this week? No, that's right. I've been really, uh, I've been really busy working working on a house uh, this week, which, uh, which you which you pointed out is, is uh, going on the market uh, very soon. And I think that brings us, uh, you know, all the updates I've been doing, that, that really brings us to today's, uh, today's subject. Yeah, to today's topic. So today we did an interview with realtor and associate broker Pam Evans of Hello Pam Evans Real Estate with Century 21 Results. Pam has been in the real estate agent or been in the real estate business for a long time. And folks, we're just going to let her talk. Here it is. Today we have realtor and associate broker Pam Evans of Hello Pam Evans Real Estate with Century 21 Results. Pam, thanks for joining us. Yeah, Pam, this is John. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. And welcome to the Handyman Pros Radio Show. Thank you, guys. I'm honored. Good to talk to both of you. Are you sure? Because we always ask, are you (laughs) sure? That's our first question. We're just kidding. Well, I I had nothing, absolutely nothing else to do today. So what the heck not? (laughs) Perfect. There you go. Great alternative. Um, I love you guys. I'm happy to. How can I help? Awesome. So, Pam, tell our audience a little bit about you and a little bit about your business and how you got into it. Okay. Well, I've been in real estate for 10 years. Um, I'm now an associate broker. I have a referral only business. Prior to being in real estate, I was in marketing for 22 years, which made transitioning into real estate and selling homes uh, a little bit more natural. I understand what it takes to market, to target, um, and to get a product sold. So uh, I love what I do. I love marketing and I love real estate and I actually love working uh, one-on-one with people. So real estate is absolutely perfect for me. Well, awesome. So speaking of selling, I guess today we wanted to discuss a, a little conversation about selling your house and what are the important things and, and things like that. So give us give us some t- some best practices and that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, I like to refer to this as a seller mindset. It's getting into the, the right mindset if you're thinking about selling your home. And I would say that the first step is because I I talk to people a lot and they say, you know, when my last kid graduates high school in 2021, we want to sell the house. You know, we're ready to downsize or move on. And I suggest to people, well, let me come visit you now. Let me look at your house. Let's put a game plan together Um, because it's the preparation and planning that will make the sale the most successful. It'll minimize your stress and it will uh, usually generate the highest sales price for you. So that's like a so you're doing like a an, a pre sale interview or something like that. Explain that a little more. Yeah. Sure. So if somebody is targeting a you know a year and a half, two years out, I, I've done this with many people. I'll come to their house. There's there's no obligation. Um, I don't want people to feel like I'm trying to pressure them, but I want them to understand that the preparation and planning is such a key part. So we'll walk through the house and people will usually say, you know, I'm going to do a few changes before I put the house on the market. And I'll say, okay, great. Tell me what you're thinking you'll do. And we'll walk through the house and they'll say, well, you know, I I know I need to get rid of the wallpaper in the bathroom. And, you know, this green carpet, you know, probably has to go. And, you know, I'm going to, they may pick a project that really is not necessary you know so we'll go through and i'll understand what they're thinking and you know approximately what their budget is because my job is to be very frugal with people's money um if they're going to spend a thousand dollars you know i want them to get a thousand dollars back plus Mm -hmm. Uh, i want to have good roi in, in helping people spend their money or get people to understand often people will say well yeah the carpet you know i know i should replace it but 
you know, my, my buyer probably won't like the color I pick. So I'm just going to give an allowance and, and just talking through the pros and cons of giving an allowance. Cause in theory, in theory, allowances make perfect sense. In reality, um, they don't work. They're not effective. Um, so we will walk through the house, um, just kind of take an assessment, understand what they're thinking. I'll give suggestions about what things would be really helpful to do. I try to give inexpensive suggestions. For example, you know, there's a lot of homes that have, you know, the original shiny brass door knobs, you know, all throughout. And they just are, they make a house look very dated. So I'll suggest to people, just go to Lowe's or Home Depot and get some of the lever handles, you know, levers, not more knobs, and just do a neutral, you know, brushed nickel. And if you replace all the doorknobs, at least on your main level, it's a fairly inexpensive investment and it really elevates the look. It makes it, the home look a little bit more upscale, a little bit more um, not as dated. Um, you kind of transform it in an inexpensive way. So that's the type of thing we, we look at, you know, light fixtures, water fixtures, paint color. And we, we put together a game plan of what's important to do. And then I suggest to people, well, let's put together a sequence. I, I can, most people say, well, I have no idea who to hire to do this, or I can do some of the work myself, but I, you know, I'm not really good with plumbing or electrical. And I always encourage people to hire professionals because you want to minimize any potential problems. We're going to have the house inspected, you know, by a future buyer. So it's good to hire guys like you to do it right the first time. And it won't look like a do-it-yourself project. So it, it depends on where the, the owner's mindset is. But we kind of just put together a game plan. And I recommend people who can do the work. And we put together a sequence of what should be done when. And I usually suggest to people, and most people are familiar with, you know, paint trends change. Right now we're in whites and light grays with splashes of blues. You know, that could change a year and a half from now. So let's not paint today. Let's reserve painting till the end. So putting together a calendar. And it just helps people see things in a little bit more of a sequential bite size. It helps them budget. And I often visit people several times throughout the year just to check in, to say, yeah, or they get my opinion about something. Um, but it's the planning process that tends to produce the best results. You know, that's, this is really, this is really interesting to me because, um, I just noticed that myself over the years, um, that you just don't realize the changes that take place, you know, and it's great to have this type of a, um, a planning session so that there's no surprises, you know, kind of, and everything kind of goes smoothly. Yep. And, you know, I just, you know, we, you just live in a house for a long time. And in your example, you know, days go by, years go by, and you just don't really realize how things have changed. Right. You don't see things with fresh eyes. And what I like to describe to, to owners is, have you ever seen HGTV? Yes, of course. I love H HGTV. Great. So do your buyers. <laughs> and what has happened, it's an interesting phenomenon. It used to be you could put your house on the market and if it wasn't updated or didn't have this or that, buyers would just make low offers. And they don't do that anymore. Buyers have too much information at their disposal. Um, they also tend to be less visual because they watch these shows and they see a transformation of a house. So they expect to walk into a home and it be fully updated for them. They can't look at a house. For example, I bought a, a ranch a couple of years ago and renovated it. I walked in and it was the perfect floor plan in the perfect geographic location with the perfect amount of yard space and, you know, level lot. Walked in and it was yellow paint, brass, wallpaper everywhere, um, outdated light fixtures. And I was like, I can see, I can totally see how this will change. I could see it in my head, but I am the, the one of few who can visualize the potential of a home. And that is what sellers need to understand that if a buyer walks into your home and it's, you know, was perfectly current in 1993, <laughs> uh, 
that buyers aren't visualizers. And if they see, see that the kitchen needs to be updated, you know, they'll assume that maybe a $10,000 project really costs fifteen to $20,000 because buyers really don't know how to estimate things like that. Why would they? Um, so they'll overestimate the cost of a project. They also will think, oh my goodness, that's a pain in the neck. And um, so they're going to want a super good deal on your house because they're inheriting your deferred maintenance or your update project. So you stand to either spend $10,000 to do it yourself and put it on the market or lose thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 on the sale price because your house will sit because buyers have a lot to choose from. Um, the market is very robust in Atlanta. Um, our market really doesn't stop ever. It stops maybe in, July, uh, in August when kids go back to school or during an ice storm. But other than that, our, we have decent weather. So buyers and sellers are can make it happen. But you have to understand current market conditions, what your current current comp sales are close to you, and work with a good realtor to help you. Because every other house on the market is your competition. So how do you differentiate yourself from the competition and then working with somebody who's going to be very cost effective with your money? Does that make sense? It does. It kind of fits right into our mold. We are big on maintenance at uh, the Handyman Pros Radio Show. We're big on maintenance. We're big on long time frames. These are the takeaways I'm taking from this right now is that if you plan this out with a couple of years in advance, you're not you don't get overwhelmed in the short term, right? So right. taking taking doorknobs, John and I just did a job not too long ago, actually over the summer. And anyway, we, <laughs> we changed, John, how many doorknobs did you change? <laughs> I, just, I changed like 18 doorknobs. And right. it, it was, a, it actually ended up being a, a pretty substantial investment when, when yeah. it was particularly a big investment in time. John was changing doorknobs for what, a day? I mean, it seemed like it anyway. Yeah. Um, it takes, you know, it, things take longer than people expect, not all the time, but if you have that big window, it's it's hugely important. And I think that's one of the takeaways I'm taking here. Would that be right, Pam? Is that what you're, what you're pointing out to people? Absolutely. And, and different sellers approach things differently. For example, I have a, a listing I'm going to be working on now. I've been speaking with the seller and these people are very proactive. They're um, they've been using this house as a rental property. They used to reside in it. Now they're using it as a rental and now they'd like to sell it because their kid's going off to college and they need some extra cash. Perfectly reasonable. Um, but they recognize that um, the house could use some work and they also would like some fresh eyes on it. So they had me come down and they said, well, we don't want to be surprised by you know things that will come up in an inspection report. Um, they're very wise about that to, to know something might be potentially problematic in your house. Everything is fixable, but it's a lot easier to fix things when you get an inspector. It's called a pre-listing inspection. So we're lining up a pre-listing inspection. They're going to go through the house and then items that need to be fixed. We're going to roll into the, um, the repair project of renovating their master bath. You know, their master bath is very dated. And we had the conversation about what's most important to buyers is kitchen master bath, uh, because that's where a lot of time is spent. We're also often, not to sound stereotypical, but appealing to the female. Um, females are more emotional driven. Um, so you kind of got to balance all that and how you present your home to the market. So my point is that the seller is recognizing that it's a lot easier to make a decision and get estimates to repair a possible surprise that an inspector um, may find it's easier to do that now than when you're in the middle of a contract period and due diligence mm -hmm. period and you're, you're pressed by time and it just elevates stress unnecessarily. That's right. So that's a very proactive why seller and I'm, I'm enjoying working with them very much. And I've worked with other people who we've walked through and, uh, you know, we were going to list it low to mid 500s. And they said they were walking through the home and uh, it was dark paint um, and carpeting in the family room and everything else was hardwoods. And they said, well, we're going to replace that carpeting because, you know, it's a little worn and blah, blah, blah. I said, would you consider instead of replacing carpet, estimating putting down hardwoods there? You know, it's probably a 15 by 15 foot spot. And they said, well, no, it's going to cost more money. I said, I, I understand that but it's the main level of an over half a million dollar home. And we want to get the highest 
price for it, make your home look as large as possible. So not having different flooring, if you just have all one flooring all throughout, it makes a home look bigger as is when you paint it light colors. So we talked about all of that and they, they did end up making the investment um, to put hardwoods down and it really transformed the look. So getting people to understand not to be penny wise and pound foolish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you ever get people that after they do all this say, "Huh, I really like this home. Now I think I'll stay." <laughs> yes, most people say that, and I laugh and I say, "Well, it's going to come on the market. Are you interested in buying it?" <laughs> <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for letting me help you out. Thanks, Here's my yeah. bill. <laughs> Here's my yeah. bill. That's right. Here's my bill. Most um, people are very pleased with the end product, and if we've spent wisely, they see the value and. It's people that run off and do things on their own and they take out a home equity line of credit and they don't really get competitive quotes and, you know, they're $35,000 into repairs and then they call me Mm -hmm. and I say, well, you know, here are some suggestions. Why? We can't afford to do it anymore. I'm like, well, why did you put up those medallions around the trim of the house? That that's not a, you know, it's not helpful to your sale that $2,000 would have been, much better spent doing X, Y, Z. So again, planning ahead and then working with somebody who's got your pocketbook in mind. My job is to be very stingy with the seller's money. I wanted them to spend where they're going to get the best bang for their buck. It'll allow me to present their house in the, the best possible way. And all the professional marketing I do will then pay off because people will want to come see this house. It'll visually look appealing, especially to the buyers who aren't visual thinkers. Right. And you, and, and just as a kind of an aside, your time for, I, I've known you for a long time and you've done, you've sold some of my houses and things like that. How, when you, when you do these repairs, I'm, I'm asking the question, when you do these kinds of repairs, does it speed up the turnover time? I mean, are you, you know, do you sit on properties even in bad markets if the, if it's done properly? If we, pres- if we, update the right things, um, present the house as it should be, and then price it, right it should sell barring a recession right i mean that's that, that's kind of that hidden value right is time is how long does it take you to sell because if you don't do the updates people come in and they turn around and walk out at least i've seen that happen anyway or they don't even bother because they're looking at everything online and if your house doesn't look appealing unless your house is seventy five thousand dollars under market value they're not going to bother come seeing your outdated house and assume you're going to take less money. There's way too much on the market to choose from. And that's the thing. This is, in my, in my opinion, this right now is a, somewhat of a balanced market. You could say statistically it's a seller's market because most things are selling in three months or less, which is by definition a seller's market. Balanced market, um, anything over nine months is, is a buyer's market that it sits on them. But the, there's enough to choose from that it reflects benefit to both buyers and sellers. Interest rates are very low right now. If a buyer can lock in, they get more house for their money. They can they can go up, see more houses because they can afford more house. So that's very buyer friendly. And there's a lot to choose from on the market. That's very buyer friendly. A seller's market is when things just fly off the shelf. If a seller doesn't price right from the beginning, I have a friend who... I just recently, um, let's just say I listed his house and we've known each other a long time and he wanted to try it super high, not just high, but super high because I had talked to him eight months earlier and I said, here, if we were going to go in the market today is approximately where I would list your house. Well, things change and I always let sellers know that here's what I think your house would list for today and what it would sell for today. But if we're not going to go in the market in a couple months, I'm always going to reevaluate everything because if we can raise your, your list price, or do we have to adjust it down a little? And I'll always show them factually why and what else is on the market. So always be with current information. Anyway, I understand pushing an envelope with a seller. The worst thing that you can do is price a home exactly right. It goes under contract right away. The first thing that goes through a seller's mind is we priced it too low. And I never want a seller to feel like we left money on a table. So I'm always willing to push the envelope a bit. Um, But when you go too crazy and are just priced $20,000, $30,000, $40,000 too high, 
you're just going to sit. It's going to be crickets. So it's, it's discussing all of those dynamics, what the market conditions are today, what else has sold, how desirable is your location, you know, everything. But my job is to sell for the highest price I possibly can because that's my job for my seller. Hmm. Pam, you know, I, I um, the, the other side of uh, I, I, the, uh, a question here is you hear every once in a while that the term of somebody that's just kind of um, – overbuilt their house for the neighborhood or something like that, you know, as a seller, you know, do you, do you run into those situations where somebody has just really poured in a ton of money in their home and yeah. it's, and it's just, you know, way outside of what the neighborhood really, really is, I guess. I don't know how to really frame that, but maybe you can expand on that. Yeah. I mean, that those are very um, delicate conversations to have once the damage is done. Um, because you don't want to be like, dude, Mm -hmm. (laughs) what were you thinking, man? Right. Well, I, I have a, I have a neighbor and I'm thinking of it and, uh, that's, that's, that's why I bring it up. Yes. Well, I had, um, recently, um, owned uh, one of the smaller homes in the neighborhood. Um, I bought it after the recession. I got it for a great price, which was wonderful. And I made the right updates to it and I was able to turn around and, generate a 46% improvement in profit in four years. While I was getting ready to list the house, the neighbors um, next door had finally decided to develop the lot and they were building a house that was considerably larger than mine and approximately double the price. And I thought that is so good for me. Mm -hmm. And I cautioned them. I said, just be really careful. Please don't overspend. You don't want to be the most expensive home in the neighborhood because people don't tend to want to buy the most expensive home in the neighborhood. If they can afford your home, they will most likely jump to the next level up in neighborhoods and be one of the lower to mid price homes in that neighborhood. It's very hard to sell, to own and to sell the most expensive, the largest, the biggest, the prettiest house in the neighborhood, because you are pulling everybody else's property values up. But conversely, they are all pulling your property value down. So once it's done, it's done. And then it's just a matter of working through things with sellers. I had that a couple of years ago that they they had bought the model home in the neighborhood. It was the biggest lot. It used to be the builder's personal home. And they couldn't understand why they didn't get a 7% a year appreciation, you know, and therefore they should be able to sell their house for six, whatever. I I said, I understand your math. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) But, and, and that was difficult. So I, I have to tackle those as well and I will get it done, but I will, the market dictates the value. I will present your home in the best possible way with all my tools and techniques and, and professional strategies, but ultimately a house is worth what a buyer will pay for it. And appraisal is just what it should appraise for, but the market dictates. Sure. I have one, one, one other question. And that is, I know we talked a lot about the inside of the house with the kitchens and the bath and the carpet and the floors. Um, what about, what about the outside? You know, that, the, you know, the outside, the landscaping, the curb appeal and things like that. I'm sure that's all part of it, but we really did discuss that. Yep, um, absolutely. You, The house needs to have some curb appeal. And an, I, I can actually go through. I have a little booklet I prepared, several simple tips for sellers. But part of that is um, when somebody pulls up in front of your house, you know, your, your roof should be clean, not have brush, you know, pine straw all over the roof or yep. stains. Um, you know, the stains is just, I guess, mold and stuff that grows naturally on a roof. Well, have your roof, you know, professionally clean. It's just a couple hundred dollars to not have streaks and stains all over your roof. You don't want um, your buyer to walk up to your front door and there's wood rot all around the door frame and, you know, big gaps in where the brick hits the house, you know, all the things like that. It looks, the impression is, wow, you didn't really take great care of the outside. I can only imagine what the inside looks like. And it's not a conscious level of thinking. But if your house does not look attractive and inviting and it, Mm -hmm. no pretty house with a cute front door and a big pot of flowers out front, you want people to emotionally feel it. 
that feeling. Oh, like, oh, I can't wait to see this house. All right, John, then, you got to take the car off the blocks. That's all I'm saying. Right, <laughs> right, right. And the and and the old uh, bass bass boat out the front yard. Yep. And trimming your bushes and fresh mulch or pine straw and you know right. just your limbs. You know, uh, raise your canopy on the ha- on the trees so when you park your car in the front of the house, you can actually see the home. It's not blocked by all these low hanging branches. I go through all of that with with sellers just in a very easy, you know, step one, step two, step three kind of way. And a lot of the work people can do themselves if they want to, or if not, there are plenty of people who will be happy to, to help them with all of this. Yeah, you're at, you're absolutely right. When you, when, you know, just when I drive through the neighborhood and there is a house that doesn't look like it's uh, quite repair, you kind of think, I wonder if it's not, if it's not looking good on the outside, you know, what's it, what's it looking like on the inside and what's been neglected? Exactly. You're thinking, what can I, what can't I see? Right. Exactly. Yeah. We, we, uh, you know, professionally, John and I see this all the time. You know, we see uh, doors and windows that are literally rotting apart. Um, We see gutters that are hanging. We see tons of trees on roofs and things like that. And the home inspectors, as you know, will pick all that stuff off. And we, we, you know, we can make all the suggestions we want, but they just think we're trying to churn money, but we're generally not. Um, We're actually trying to work out their best interest. What's yep, it? same thing. When people say, "Well, of course you want to sell my house for the highest possible price because you'll make the most amount of money," and I'm like, "Well, uh, yeah, we both will win. I I don't earn an, a paycheck uh, until your house sells. Um, n- neither of us are winners if we don't get it sold. So I would think that you would want to take as much equity out of your house as possible, and I will help you do that. So." It's getting people to understand my motivation is their motivation, that I'm very much driven by doing a great job for clients because then they're most likely to tell their friends about what a great, honest job I did with great integrity and I gave them good advice. And I'll also, you know, tell it like it is. Sometimes I've had to turn down listings. If the seller and I are not on the same page and it's going to be a frustrating relationship for both parties, I just respectfully decline that I am not the best person to help them. So I want to work with people who are interested in my recommendations. Um, you don't just hire anybody to, and think your house will magically get sold for the highest price. There's a lot that goes into it strategically. And part of that is planning and getting the sellers to understand that this will be great ROI. You'll get good bang for your buck if you do these things. Well, awesome. Any other tips that you could give our listeners? Uh. Yes, people tell me which, what are the basic things that I should do? And, you know, we talk about decluttering and, and John, you had touched on this earlier and we can talk about this in the future if you ever want to talk about downsizing, you know, how to go about yes. doing that. But, you know, people think, oh my God, I've been in this house for 30 years. I have no idea where to start and I had no idea how much stuff I had accumulated. And I hear that <laughs> all the time. John, it's okay. I feel like I should hold your hand. <laughs> That's, it's funny. It's funny, you know, it, it, and, that, and that is the truth because you, you just can't believe how much junk you accumulate over over the years. And yep. my my wife's always on me about about that. And when I sold a house up in Chicago, I um, it was only a thirteen hundred square foot house, but it I I took out six tons six tons of junk out of it. <laughs> wow! But that was sixty That's years. Crazy. That was, that, was, that was 60 years. Yeah, but still, it's a little house. You wouldn't expect that much stuff. I mean, it was incredible. So, But you're right. Um, you, you do accumulate a lot of stuff. And, and I had a neighbor that you know, I went in his house. He asked me to help. I couldn't believe it. Nice house. And it was just filled yep. everywhere. I, I, you couldn't even walk through it. It was that bad. I was like, really? Oh, this is bad news, man. So that's well, sound, that's sounding like a whole nother show. Yeah. So I, I think for decluttering, and there are also professional people that can help you do that. But you just basically start in one room and one corner, and work left to right, and just make three piles. So we can talk about all that. Yeah, that sounds that, that, that sounds like yeah. a whole different show. And actually, so we had all, we also wanted to touch on we didn't have time today, but we wanted to touch on first time home buyers. So Pam, would oh. you come back on the Handyman Pro sh- Radio Show sometime and do a couple of more topics for, with us? I would be honored to do so. That I is, love you guys. I have great admiration for both of you and the work that you do. You guys do very good quality work, and everything is right the first time, and that is so incredibly helpful. 
Well, awesome. Well, if yeah, somebody thanks. needs to get a hold of you, tell us mm. a little bit about the area that you service and how they can get a hold of you. Uh, my office is located in Cumming, Georgia, but I actually do all of North Metro Atlanta. I'm referral only. So if somebody says, you know, I loved how you helped me. Do you mind helping my aunt sell her house? Sure, absolutely. Where's your aunt? Oh, way over there. That's fine. Um, but I predominantly do um, North Fulton, uh, all of Forsyth County, um, all of Lake Lanier. But if there's somebody a little bit outside of that scope, Roswell, Alpharetta, uh, you know, even in Cobb, even Gwinnett, I've worked all of those areas. I'm, I'm happy to help. But that's where I'm based is Metro Atlanta. I'm doing a lot of work in Sandy Springs right now for some reason, but Sandy Springs is awesome. So is there a, a website or an email they can send to you, get a hold of you? Sure. Um, my email is hello, Pam Evans, H E L L O P A M E V A N S. Hello, Pam Evans at gmail.com. Or I'm happy to take calls. My number is, or you can call or text at 678 778 6551. And I appreciate it. All right, Pam. Well, thank you for being on the show, and we will have you on again. Thanks, Thanks. guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. You bet. Thank you, Pam. Wow, that was a great inter- interview with a bunch of information. That was that was great. I really uh, I really enjoyed that that interview. Yeah, what were some of the key takeaways that you took out of there, John? Well, I think the first one was that the the pre planning the sale is uh, is a critical component to to the whole process. You know, so there's no there's no surprises and everything that kind of keeps the ball rolling, so everything goes smoothly. Yeah, I took out. I was I was really intrigued with the whole concept of the timeline, right? So have the timeline in place with a mm-hmm. lot of time before you list, because it it's just. And we know this from doing what we do. Nothing can be fixed overnight. It all has it has, takes time, right? So build a timeline. Give yourself plenty of time if you're two years out or whatever. Do that. What were some of the other things you took away, John? Well, I, you know, the other thing I took away was that, you know, having having those two things we just talked about, re, you know, planning and then having a timeline is just it really does create uh, a differentiator for you in the marketplace, you know, so that that there are no surprises that you are prepared to sell your house and that you are competitive in in the market. Yeah, amazing. I thought it was a great interview. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Handyman Pros Radio Show, John. The spaceship has landed. Do we look at it or take it apart? Ladies and gentlemen, if you've enjoyed this podcast and have derived some value from it, here's four things you can do. One, tell your friends about this podcast. Two, hit subscribe on your podcast player. While you're there, leave us a review. Three, subscribe to our newsletter by going to handymanprosradioshow.com and click on the subscribe button. We'll inform you of upcoming events, shows, and give you actionable tips for maintaining your home and property. And four, send us an email with your questions to questions at handymanprosradioshow.com. That's handymanprosradioshow.com. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on the Handyman Pros Radio Show.